Thank you and welcome everyone to the 2020 ASPPH Virtual Annual Meeting. My name is Jonathan Sung, Manager of Educational Initiatives for ASPPH. Our moderator today is Dr. Lisa McCormick. Dr. McCormick is the Associate Dean for Public Health Practice at the University of Alabama at Birmingham School of Public Health. So please join me in welcoming our moderator and speakers for today's session. Thank you, Jonathan. I'm very happy to have the opportunity to moderate this session, Teaching to Engage Undergraduate Students. This session features three presentations selected from abstract submissions for the Undergraduate Public Health and Global Health Education Summit. It is now my honor to introduce our presenters and I will do this in the order that they will present. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Katie Darby Hine. Dr. Hine is a clinical assistant professor and internship coordinator in the Department of Health Promotion at the University of Georgia College of Public Health Undergraduate Public Health Program. Dr. Hine will present setting up service learning projects locally across the country and globally, strategies that work and lessons learned. Next will be Dr. Jessica Kruger. Dr. Kruger is a clinical assistant professor in the Department of Community Health and Health Behavior at the University at Buffalo School of Public Health and Health Professions. Dr. Kruger will present developing, implementing, evaluating uh, an undergraduate course on public health and incarceration, assessing pedagogical approaches. And then finally, Dr. Angela Clendenin. Dr. Clendenin is an instructional assistant in the Department of Epidemiology and Biostatistics at the Texas A&M School of Public Health. Dr. Clendenin will present Putting the Prepared in Public Health Preparedness, a team-based learning approach to public health emergency preparedness. We encourage you to stay close to your device during this, during this session to engage with speakers. You can ask questions or submit comments in writing at any time during the session by clicking on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. We will hold all questions until the end of all presentations. Now, I would like to invite Dr. Hine to begin. Thank you, Lisa. I'm gonna be talking about how we set up service learning projects in our major at the University of Georgia. Um, the health promotion major, it's health promotion and behavior, is the behavioral arm in our College of Public Health. And we incorporate service learning, which is a high impact practice, at the beginning of the major and at the end of the major. And bookend it purposefully, it's pretty nerve wracking at the end of the major, and we try to help students prepare for that and be ready by work with this course that we do at the beginning of the major. Um, Athens Clark County is a pretty typical academic county. It is um, relatively impoverished and students um, may or may not be familiar with some of the communities. They live in this little bubble and so we have them go out and get to know um, a variety of different experiences while they're in the major. Um, a quick review, service learning doesn't have a minimum number of hours. It is important that we tie the work that the students do out in the world back to the learning outcomes of the course. Um, reflection is a really critical piece of that. And as long as that is happening, the length of the service learning is not the priority. I do have a few tips for what I do. So for the course that we do when students start the major, um, I need to make sure that I'm really really communicating with the preceptors before the students start while they are there and then as they are finishing up. Um, I've gotten to know the community pretty well. I think that that's a really critical piece of this because if I don't know the different places where the students can go out, I can't be that much help to get the students out there. Um, and those short experiences that we do at the beginning of the major, and I should probably clarify that the beginning of the major is junior year. Students apply to the major, it's a high demand major, and so these are third year students. Um, and so we have this short experience in their first foundations course. And since I set that up ahead of time with our preceptors in the community, it takes just a lot of coordination before the course starts. 
um, I do strongly recommend that we look for faculty training because this is hard and it takes a lot of time. Um, at the University of Georgia, we have service learning fellowships, um, and I was a service learning fellow a few years ago. Time is set aside in some of my duties, and there's actually a monetary component to that, so it's really helpful. We have a really good service learning office. Um, I did get e-portfolio training because in the last course, the internship, the students do their reflective writing as a blog, and all of their work goes on to an e-portfolio. Um, and then, of course, training workshops. Even if you don't have dedicated centers, those workshops can be really helpful. Um, and my biggest advice is to be really creative and as flexible as you can be. Um, something's going to go wrong. <laughs> um, the prearranged service learning projects are just 20 hours. And in these short experiences, there are a few things that you can do to make this work a little bit better. If you can find sites that can take more than one student, that's really helpful. So eight students would be really good. These classes can be quite large, 75. And so if you have um, a handful of sites, not 75 sites, it's a really big help. Um, and then the preceptors help keep track of the hours with the students. It gives the students some practice negotiating with the preceptors about the hours. Um, they have to verify those hours and they're going to have to do that later. So this increases their confidence. I <laughs> think would be a good way to say that. Um, and the reflection for this is so much shorter than the large reflection they have to do for their internship. So it just gives them some experience with what do we mean when we say this is service learning and this is a reflection. Um, you're not just writing what you think, you're tying it back to the course outcomes. At the end of the program of study, students do a semester long internship and that service learning project is a very specific service learning project where students set it up themselves. So they're doing something that they really want to be doing professionally. Um, so as you are doing a prearranged service learning project, that work is done before the course starts. But I'd like to note that that's true for the ones that aren't prearranged as well. You do have to have memoranda of understanding. Um, so that's a little bit of work that has to happen before students go out to the site. Some sites require background checks. Um, some students don't live um, near the sites. Maybe they don't have a car, maybe they live on campus. So having at least one site that you know they can get to you want your sites to have a variety of times so that if students have um, work for money, if they have jobs, they can work around those schedules as well. Um, and then the students, once they are out at a site and do a really good job, I just wanna point out that then our community members look forward to having groups of students later. So the first time setting up might be a little bit harder. After that, they might contact you to say, when are they coming? The ones that are student arranged um, takes a little bit of talking with students individually because you want for them to find a semester long internship um, that is either something very different that they want to do and they want more experience or that's going to give them some experience as they're going out into the world. Um, and they are not always that great at ePortfolios, so they really do need to learn how to do that. Um, we have a capstone course where they set it up, but there's a little bit of work there. So I did go and get myself trained up on how to do that as well. Um, and talking to the site preceptors is also really important because they are going to help you grade these students and they need to feel really comfortable and to know who you are. And again, you need an MOU, a memorandum of understanding. Um, there are some other considerations, including the background checks, the vaccines, other training students might need. Um, we had a couple of students get stuck at a global placement during this COVID-19 business and global sites really do. It's critically important that you have a study abroad program set up for those students. So that takes a little bit of work ahead of time. Um, in Athens, we have a MPH program. We have other undergraduate programs. We're a big state university and we also have a medical school branch. So we have medical students. So we, there's a lot of competition for community placements. So you do want to be able to have students have work that is um, maybe different than what those students would do. So for example, Athens Clark County has a large wellness screening for all of the employees and students go as sort of this practicum placement and 
um, spend a short amount of time, really intense, doing biometric screening and doing the health fair. And an MPH student might need 300 hours, but these students only need 20 hours, so it's perfect. It's the exact right amount of time. Um, they're also willing to do sort of more grunge work that has to be done at sites, paperwork work on the computer, fixing the website, emailing clients, um, calling up clients. So that's the kind of thing that these students can do that can really help the sites and still help the students learn. Um, there are campus resources. All of us are so different, but the campus resources, I strongly encourage you to figure out what you might have. So uh, cobbling together webinars, workshops, um, we have um, scholarship funding for students, so figuring that out and helping students link up with that. Um, our Office of Global Engagement has some really large scholarship dollars tied to certain countries, so it's helpful to know and you can help students get places um, and maybe even spend less if they go far away. Um, we have an experiential learning requirement. I think that's increasingly common and there is some scholarship help there as well. So it's helpful to know these resources. Um, there are absolutely some challenges and some of them we all know. So it's time consuming. It is um, a little bit of juggling balls and they, I call it noodles falling off my plate when I have too much macaroni on my plate. Um, and it requires relationship building. So you have to be willing to do that work. That groundwork is important. Um, student reflections can just end up being a log of what they did and so you have to help the students know what to do as they're doing the writing and then you have to read it. Um, and then of course sometimes things don't go the way you meant for them to go. <laughs> so when that happens, then what? So honestly, sometimes students can't pass a background check. And we have to have a plan for that. What are you going to say? You can't do this major. Public health isn't for you. Um, of course not. Um, so having some sites where that may not be necessary um, is very helpful, um, particularly for the 20 hour one, the 300 hour internship, it's a little bit easier to navigate around, but you don't want to hang up a student for some small project just because this something happened in their life. Um, health issues happen, students get sick, do they need another semester to get this done, do they need a change in placement, a new site. Um, mental health issues can really come up. One of our sites is a hospice and sometimes students don't handle death and dying as well as they thought they might. Um, so we have to be prepared to go in and help students switch it around. Um, sometimes we have to help students communicate. They still think email is like texting and <laughs> knowing how to email properly is very helpful. Um, we've had preceptors leave sites in the middle of their internship or in the middle of their program. How do you rearrange things? Um, and of course, COVID was a pretty big interruption, wasn't it? <laughs> um, and then sometimes students make mistakes. So we've actually um, had situations where students were not a great fit for a site and we had to change things around. Um, other challenges can happen. Um, so with a graduate group going in to do a needs assessment, I had one of my biggest problems where um, the students felt the needs assessment wasn't being done correctly and they were actually correct and the preceptor was very unhappy. Um, so this is where being really willing to step in and be diplomatic and sort of take one for the students can be really helpful. Um, the students felt in another project that there were racial overtones to a project that was being done, meaning that um, the needs assessment that was being done was discriminating against African Americans and you, you have to be willing to help make some changes at, with the preceptors as well as with the students. Um, luckily that happened. <laughs> changes were made successfully um, without anybody getting too upset. Um, students have been sexually harassed in the field. Um, several experiences with Meals on Wheels, for example, or Lunch Buddies, where um, students are with older adults in their homes and the older adults don't always act appropriately. Um, you have to be prepared for that kind of event. We've had students on site when ICE made a raid or when a horse threw a child off. Um, the hospice death of a client um, can be very challenging for students. So you have to really help students handle those major events. Um, this is where um, verbal reflection can be very helpful. Um, and then of course, if a project is interrupted and cannot continue, um, that's a really big challenge. Um, so um, we had a site that wanted um, 
a student to sign some paperwork that was really paperwork an employee would sign, not an intern. And it just got really uncomfortable for the student and we had to interrupt the project. Um, so sometimes the project just isn't working properly and it has to be completely changed. So when things, when those interruptions happen, um, it's very important that you have already communicated with the preceptor and that preceptor knows who you are so they can work with you. It's a team effort, the three of you. Um, and that's been a huge help with this pandemic. A major pandemic is a pretty big interruption. So, of course, having students out for a full internship, those inter internships are being interrupted, but even the short projects were interrupted. So working with the preceptors to see if remote work can be planned has been really helpful. Um, so I encourage a dedicated short service learning project to help students figure out what service learning is, to help students know what the steps are that we're going to require later when they have to do it on their own. Um, and although it requires a great deal of planning and communication, it's it's worth it for us too. And it's so great for me to get to know the community members. So I, I encourage it. Um, the ePortfolio is a great thing students have when they leave. They put that link on their resume and they go. Um, we have a number of writing projects there. Some really great work can be showcased. Um, and really in conclusion, service learning has been one of the best high impact practices that the students have done. They get to practice real life skills and it's so much more fun than just reading a textbook. And I encourage you, the book ending has been very effective for us, beginning and end. And um, I love it. Um, thank you very much. I appreciate your attention. Thank you, Dr. Hine. Now I'd like to introduce Dr. Kruger. Thank you very much. I'm excited to be here with everyone today and talk to you about uh, the very important topic of incarceration and public health along with what we're doing um, at the University at Buffalo around this topic and evaluating it. So overall, in this country, this is an emerging topic. Incarceration has traditionally been seen as a criminal justice issue, yet with 5% of the world's population, we are incarcerating 25% of the world's prisoners. And this not only affects the individuals who are justice involved, but also their families and their communities. 95% of people who enter the criminal justice system will be released. And so this topic really spans historical and contemporary context. In developing this course, there was a request for proposals. And this came from the Columbia Incarceration and Public Health Action Network to create courses around incarceration and public health. This provided us with a really unique opportunity to create a course specifically for undergrads, uh, because previously there have been some courses created for graduate students, but to our knowledge at that time, none at the undergraduate level. We have a brand new undergraduate public health program that started in 2017. And so we're excited to provide this new upper level elective course, public health, um, incarceration and public health to our juniors and seniors. And really in this course, we're focusing on the issues and principles around mass incarceration and thinking about it as a way to create solutions. So some of the topics that we cover are the historical and health issues, the social justice issues, prevention, and this is the second time that it is taught um, as of this semester. So the course is broken up into four major modules. The first looks at the overview of the US uh, system. And this really focuses on how the criminal justice system works and focusing on the differences between jails and prisons so that we can have discussions around some of the, the challenges with the different types of detention centers. We also work on global comparisons and looking at what other countries do, particularly countries such as Norway and Sweden, 
which have different focuses uh, on the criminal justice system and how they um, really rehabilitate uh, prisoners. So within this module, uh, we have uh, discussions on the overview. And then moving into our second module, we look at the social and structural contributing factors to mass incarceration. This includes things like the war on drugs, but also social determinants of health and health disparities. Furthermore, the intergenerational effects of incarceration and the school to prison pipeline. Within this module, students are able to engage in two experiential learning opportunities. The first going to bail bonds hearings, the second also going to the local holding center. And so these are optional trips for students and thankfully with the funding from the IPAN grant, we're able to cover the cost for the students to attend these. Next is the health and incarceration module, looking at healthcare access and specific populations such as older adults, women, LGBTQ+, uh, focusing on harm reduction along with other chronic conditions in which uh, justice involved individuals have higher rates of morbidity and mortality with. And lastly, life after incarceration. So with 95% of the individuals being released back into the community, we really need to talk about transition, employment, identity, housing, uh, parole, and sadly, in some cases, recidivism. So you can tell that this uh, course covers so many um, opportunities for public health professionals to learn about prevention, create plans, and move forward with thinking about ways to reduce the challenges facing this population. So we have a variety of assessments in this course, including podcasts, infographics, a deeper dive research paper, and students serve as discussion leaders. On the side here, you see an example of an infographic that students have made. And with this infographic, uh, these are shared to local community organizations who work on issues with the justice involved. Students also work together to create podcasts and the podcasts span a variety of topics. Uh, they do this by uh, choosing a topic and an area to focus on. And these podcasts are listened to by their fellow students. Uh, and uh, throughout the course, they're interspersed within it. So they're able to learn from each other uh, about these really challenging topics. Lastly, the research paper uh, is an area in which the students are able to dive deeper into some of these topics. Uh, many of the topics chosen are about uh, nutrition and the incarcerated, or even about women and other special priority populations. So during this implementation, we had 40 students enrolled in the fall and 35 uh, this spring. This is a picture of the students outside the holding center. It's Buffalo, so it's cold at this time. And throughout this course, they get to hear from a variety of speakers from different backgrounds, including political science, medicine, law, public health, and psychology. And we're thankfully able to fly in these guest speakers uh, to allow the students to interact with them. And, uh, hear them face to face. So some of the successes with this project include students being able to engage in some really impactful experiential learning opportunities. Many people uh, in this course have never even heard of a bail bonds hearings, let alone set foot in a courthouse. And so this allowed them to really experience what people are going through and um, sadly, the, the very split second decisions that are made that impact people's lives. They're also able to hear from experts and meet with them in various fields. After students um, had guest lectures with the experts, they were able to have lunch in small groups uh, with some of these experts of their choice. Uh, sadly, we couldn't do that as much as we wish this semester, uh, but we hope to continue that in the future. We've also had incredible success with the students' podcast and infographics. Students really amaze me at how uh, much effort they put into these because they're really enjoying these assignments. Uh, they've interviewed uh, leaders of different organizations from around uh, the community, but also around the country. 
to create and build these podcasts. And it's really impacted the students learning about the justice involved. So with this, students have been able to take what they've learned in this course and it has really solidified what they wanna do in the future. Many of our students are now moving on to their master's in public health, but also working on a master's in social work which has been really great because they want to focus on rehabilitation efforts with these individuals and really bringing this problem to light in the public health field. We've had a lot of great feedback from this course, students talking about the experiential learning, but also this discussion-based class and how it's really impacted them. And they've really enjoyed doing some of these assignments, such as the podcast assignment. It's not often students tell you that they really like uh, doing some work in your course. Uh, and so these are really uh, wonderful accolades that we've heard from our students, along with just hearing their responses around how their thoughts have changed about uh, justice involved populations from the start of this course. So thank you very much. I look forward to questions. Thank you, Dr. Kruger. Um, now I'd like to introduce Dr. Clendenin. Thank you very much for having me and uh, thank you everybody who's listening in today. Um, obviously, some of the comments I had planned on making if we had been able to hold our actual conference are going to be a little different given the unique environment and unique situation in which we find ourselves. But I will be talking about uh, one of our required courses in public health emergency preparedness at the Texas A&M School of Public Health. There we go. So we are also, like Dr. Kruger mentioned, a relatively new program. We began in 2015. Um, and so the benefit of being a new program is you kind of get to set the standard that you want to keep. And we aimed really high. Um, we engaged in a lot of research and feedback from professionals and practice about what they would like to see in the uh, future public health professionals that we're turning out into the world. Um, one of the key things that they, they mentioned to us when we talked to them was they want students who are able to write and write well, but they also said it would be nice if students had some kind of exposure to emergency preparedness concepts. And so we were delighted to hear that because we had already incorporated this required course. And one of the assignments that we integrated into the course was uh, the students have to do four online training modules about incident command system and the national incident management system through fema and so they actually do that for a grade also sometimes people are a little hesitant to teach a course when they don't have a lot of practical experience and so how would you be even begin to credential someone to teach this course I was very fortunate that I've had the opportunity to deploy in the field in response to actual disasters and to engage with the emergency management community locally and across the state. So it was really easy for me to be credentialed to teach. So what can my students expect? Um, I have really high expectations for them. Um, the experience in my classroom is going to be based around a weekly structure that includes a lot of interaction and group work. Um, I believe in team-based learning, and I'll talk about that in a little bit more. Um, but every day that we meet, I like to start with a round of tell us something interesting or tell me something I don't know. And that encourages students to engage in what's going on in the world around them as far as public health information and the news. They can bring it forward to class. We can answer questions. We can discuss it. Um, and most of the time, that's the highlight of my day on those days when I get to teach. There is time for didactic lecture. And then on Fridays, I do what's called learning laboratories. And the picture that you're seeing on this slide is actually the week that we teach attribution investigation. And they are playing a game called What's Lurking in Lunch, which is a lot like Clue. 
And every group, every table has its own version of the game that they're playing. They have to identify the pathogen, the food, the store that sold the food, and uh, who the culprit was that introduced the pathogen into the food. When you're teaching undergraduates, particularly about something that they may not even know, have known it was a thing, like emergency preparedness, it's important to get them talking and paying attention to the world around them. As I mentioned before, we start off with tell me something I don't know or tell me something interesting. Um, but it's really about engaging them with real world application and being able to frame public health in a way that people will understand. So my class is organized around a weekly schedule. It goes Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Mondays is where we talk about team-based learning, which was the whole premise for this particular um, presentation. And what that is, is having a series of questions that I use poll everywhere. The students log in and they respond to the questions individually. It's based on a reading assignment that they were provided the week before. So this really measures how each individual student is engaged with reading the material and following through and understanding the material. After that's done, we repeat the questions, but now they get to discuss their answers as a group. And as a group, they have to arrive at a group answer. So you start really learning a little bit about the dynamics of students in your class, but also their ability to work as a team to come up with an answer. Wednesdays is didactic lecture. I go into the week with a lecture prepared for Wednesday, but based on Monday's results, if I see there are areas that the students aren't quite grasping the concepts or they're struggling to connect the dots, then that's what I'll kind of tweak my lecture on Wednesday to focus on instead of giving them a whole bunch of stuff that they already know. But the one thing that I think the students look most forward to are the learning laboratories on Fridays. And, um, they have a variety of different approaches. Um, I'm a big proponent of gamification. So when we were learning about chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear weapons, I made giant bingo cards, one for each group, and we played CBRN bingo, and they had little explosion icons they could use to cover the answers that they had. Um, I already mentioned about what's lurking in lunch. I also use simulations. Johns Hopkins Center for Global Security has created a really great um, online simulation of a global outbreak um, as a result of bioterrorism with smallpox. And I've been using that in my class where each group is assigned a country and they have to research that country's response to outbreaks and public health emergencies. And then as we roll through the simulation, each group has to make decisions based on what they know at the time and based on what they've learned about their country. And it's always an amazing thing at the end because that's when they realize that all of those cut and dry lessons that they've been learning in public health really aren't so cut and dry. And in fact, when it comes to global emergencies, as you're seeing with COVID-19, we work in a lot of shades of gray. Um, I enjoyed working with the simulation so much I applied for and um, won a teaching grant to be able to develop my own simulation to use in the classroom. So that's something that just started um, right before spring break. Uh, we, I also use a uh, kind of a teaching approach called the gallery walk. There's a, a chapter that has a lot of policies and dates and the points of those acts and policies. And so I give the uh, groups a handful of sheets and it might have a year, it might have a policy name and it may have the point of the policy or the key points of that policy. And they have to walk around the room as a group and match what they have with what other groups have. And then they have to go build a timeline on the wall and then they get to walk around it and look what everybody else put together. The other one that I do is called the great debate. And this is one that's really flexible for me. Um, if there's really nothing going on, I divide the, the class into pairs, groups. So group one and group 10, group two and group nine. And I pose a question and I assign each group to debate one side or the other. And then I will pull two students from different groups to be the judge. So there's winners and there's losers. Um, the first one this year was, is public health a help or a hindrance in emergency management? Uh, then 
we got to the chapter on the research agenda and the dual use dilemma. And so we had the debate on whether the world should retain the smallpox stores that exist for protection from future outbreaks, the retentionist, or whether those smallpox stores should be destroyed because there's too much of a risk for them to be um, acquired nefariously and used for bad purposes. And those would be the destructionists. And so we had a similar great debate in class on that. And in one class, the retentionist one, and in the next class, the destructionist one. But in the pro process of engaging in that, they had to learn to see the bigger picture and to see what the risks are and understand them and advocate for destruction or conversely to see the benefits of retaining these stores for future protection, but maybe there needed to be new safeguards in place. So what matters in this course and why we decided to make it a required course is that disasters can happen at any time. But what's important when you teach a course like this is that you're able to share with the students your experiences from the field so they see the practical application of what they're learning in the class. This is not theoretical, it's real life material. You have to be flexible and that means maybe scrapping the lecture that I had planned for the week to discuss something that happened and this happened um, with the weeks moving up to spring break when COVID-19 started becoming a thing in China. I had planned on lecturing on a different topic and we ended up just scrapping it and spending the whole day talking about what is the big deal about this new virus that's breaking out in China and why does it matter to me? My students leave that course at the end of the semester having a much better understanding of the mechanics of emergency preparedness when it relates to public health, but also I make them complete a personal preparedness plan and to create a list of items that they need to put in their go bag, which is essentially either a box or a little Tupperware plastic container or even a literal duffel bag that they can fill with emergency supplies and either keep it in their car or somewhere in their home where it's easy to grab if they had to leave in an emergency. And how do I know all of this is working? One is um, I get asked quite a bit to help students working with their personal statements for grad school or professional school. And all of them seem to mention something related to this class. Uh, requests for job seeking advice. I usually get four to five, sometimes six students a semester wanting to know how can they find a job in the market that has emergency preparedness as part of it because they realize the importance and the importance of serving the communities where they will end up. I also get a lot of thank you notes. I've included one here from a student that transferred into our program and she's one of the ones who's decided that she wants to work in emergency preparedness and disaster management. Two years ago, I also implemented a study abroad program to Germany to be able to bring a global focus to this. And we work with some emergency management partners in the federal government in Germany every summer to go over there and look at response, recovery, um, mitigation in an international sense. The first year I took 10 students and they have been amazing ambassadors for the program. And this last summer I took 20 students. I was prepared to take 20 students again this summer before COVID-19 struck, but now we're going to have that much more to talk about when we get to go in summer of 21. And with that, I'd like to thank everybody again for attending today. And I hope that you were able to find something, some little nugget that was valuable to you out of my presentation or the presentation of other speakers. And I look forward to questions. Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Clinton. Um, I'd now like to pose some questions to our presenters from the audience. And just as a reminder, you can enter questions and comments by clicking on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Um, we'll answer as many questions as we can uh, between now and the um, end of the session in the time remaining. So this first question I think is, is really targeted more uh, towards Dr. Hine uh, in your presentation, but of course, if other um, presenters have any input, we'd love to hear from you. It's a two-parter. Um, 
So first, how has your personal guidance and our organizational procedures changed in helping students find practical service learning opportunities in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic? And then could you speak more to the special opportunities for undergraduates around service learning, such as um, one-time opportunities, such as like fairs or sure. helping events and things like that? Yeah. Um, I don't know. I don't know if I know the best answer to the first question. I'm kind of living it right now. So students are working to set up um, service learning projects for the summer. And I, of course, am working to set up service learning projects for the summer. Um, and it's very challenging to know if students will be able to be on site at all this summer. And so what I would say is that I am being way more flexible than I would normally maybe be. I think that I try to be flexible, but I'm being way more flexible. So if a site has an idea for a remote project that um, maybe is something that um, might not have been the best way to spend lots and lots of time students are doing that now this semester this spring semester we have about 70 students out and all of them were interrupted um, most of the preceptors have been really willing to help brainstorm relevant projects for the students to do to complete their hours so my best answer to that question is brainstorm with your supervisors and see if there's something that can help their particular nonprofit organization, public health organization, community organization, um, meet their goals with their clients, patients, whoever they're working with, but not maybe have the students on site. Um, Undergraduate students, sometimes preceptors think that they are going to be less capable than master's students. Um, I am so biased. Our undergrad students are so capable, but they are very willing, the preceptors are very willing to ask to have students do smaller projects. Um, and so I ask about that. So when I'm talking to preceptors, it sometimes one thing will lead to another thing. So um, in athens Clark County, there is a wellness program for all city and county employees. And they do biometric screening for many, many, many people early in the morning for a couple of weeks straight. And then they hold a really large health fair for all of those employees. They get the results from their biometric screenings and get advice on what they can do to help improve some of those markers. Um, and all together, uh, many, many, many people are needed, but only about 20 hours for each person. So for undergrads, that's perfect. 20 hours is a great way to kind of dip your toe in the water, but it is um, a little bit more challenging for a master's student who must have 300 hours, for example. Um, and so we have students go to work in clinical settings where um, volunteers are needed, many volunteers are needed, but for three afternoons a week or one afternoon a week. And so if you start adding that up over a 15 week semester, it's a small number of hours. Um, and so I, I'm not sure if that answers the question well enough, but we have a variety of opportunities for students to do smaller things that maybe master's level students would think they just wouldn't have the time to do it. Thank you so much. Um, Dr. Krieger, a question for you. Um, what sorts of topics have students discussed in their podcast episodes for your course on incarceration in public health? And what kind of impact have these discussions had not only on your students, but the listeners? Excellent question. Um, I've been really amazed at the variety of topics, uh, not only having students interview people who have started programs to help people integrate back into the community, but also I've had students interview family members who are formerly incarcerated. And, you know, some of these uh, podcasts are the first time where the student has actually talked about this with that family member. And they're incredibly passionate 
unfortunate and inc incredibly sometimes heartbreaking to hear about the contributing factors that have led to someone's incarceration but also incredibly inspiring when they take the opportunity to reach out to people who are running really amazing programs and interview them as if they are an investigative journalist. Uh, so it's the, the range is diverse and the impact is incredible. When students hear work from other students, I think it just really captures their um, attention and keeps them really engaged. And, and these are relatively short podcasts, 15 to 20 minutes long. And I've had students share them with family members and friends, and we're working on a platform to actually share them uh, to the public at large uh, versus just sharing them with organizations who are involved. Thank you. And Jessica, one more question for you. And this one's really interesting. Um, Governor Cuomo uh, in New York literally just put in two provisions into uh, New York's budget yesterday. Um, judges have the discretion for pretrial hearings and elimination of cash bonds. The question is, is what are your thoughts on how the COVID-19 pandemic is affecting persons who are incarcerated? What responsibility do public health officials have in preventing its spread in prisons? Excellent and very timely question. Um, it's, this is an unprecedented time for public health to be more involved with the justice involved population. Literally bringing attention to the fact that uh, the criminal justice system is woefully unprepared to deal with a pandemic like this and that many people could lose their lives. We've heard reports of prisoners sadly dying from this, but also this puts in um, place a, a really challenge to keep uh, criminal justice workers, um, correctional officers safe during this time. And these are people who are going to be last on the list for, for PPEs, sadly. You know, these are going to uh, medical professionals. Hand sanitizer is considered contraband in um, most uh, criminal justice settings because it has alcohol and that has shifted. People have to buy their own soap. And so with these changing times and changing um, reforms, it's really putting a spotlight on some of the changes that many people have been looking forward to seeing, um, not keeping people incarcerated unless they've been convicted and removing that cash bail bond, which um, ultimately disenfranchises people who are lower SES and often people of color. And so um, I, I really hope that some of these mandates um, stay in place uh, so that people aren't sitting behind bars uh, when they could be out um, in the community if they haven't been convicted. And also just really raising awareness about the fact that you know, public health has a real opportunity to increase health for people who are just as involved, right? This is a population which we should really be thinking about because 95% of people who are just as involved will come back into your community. And you don't want people who are sicker coming back. You want to be able to create the opportunity to um, have these people have an opportunity to be well and not to spread further disease in disenfranchised communities. Thank you so much. Dr. Clendenin, um, can you speak more to the great debate activity that you mentioned? Um, and can you provide some additional examples of topics you would ask students to debate? Absolutely. Um, one of the first of the great debates we had, the one I call the great debate, is whether public health is actually a help or a hindrance when it comes to emergency response. And of course, when you're dealing with public health undergrads, they all think public health is the help. So I challenge them by thinking about how could public health be a hindrance? And that's, that's a really difficult um, topic to try and wrap your head around. The second one that we did is when we are studying research and the dual use agenda, and we have a smallpox debate between the retentionists and the destructionists. 
And that's something that goes on on a global scale. In fact, it was, I believe, May of 2019, they were revisiting that debate internationally about whether the global smallpox store should be retained for research and, and protection or whether all smallpox stores should be destroyed. And so we held that debate in our class. And actually this year, the destructionists won three debates to two. Um, so that was kind of interesting and to hear some of their logic. But you can actually take anything that's going on in the world and really turn that into a debate, try to come up with two different perspectives. But the key is to assign those perspectives so that you're forcing students to not just have the easy button and be able to do what they always know. So those were the two that we used this year. Thank you so much. Yeah, sure. Fine. Um, this is a follow up on your answer to um, your, your previous question. You, you had mentioned all of these diverse complications that arise sometimes when you're doing service learning. And one of our viewers wants to know, are you in charge of handling all of them or is there a wider range of expertise involved? How does the university support you in addressing all of them? That's a great question. Um, so I'm the undergrad internship coordinator. So I am in charge of those undergrads. We have an MPH coordinator who works with the interns for the MPH program. We talk all the time. Um, I have a lot of support. So the example that is in my head is what happened when our two students couldn't leave Peru. So Peru closed their borders and wouldn't let anybody travel and said, if you want US citizens, come and get them. And it took us a little while to do that. Um, if we hadn't had a program set up through the Office of Global Engagement, I'm not sure what that we would have been able to get them out. And so it very quickly left my hands and was with um, people who um, have more power to be able to do things like purchase a charter flight plane. Um, when I had trouble with a group who um, the group, I didn't have trouble with the group, but I had trouble with um, the preceptor thinking that the group wasn't doing what they were supposed to do. I was able to reach out to an entire group that this preceptor was working with without undermining her and work with everyone to try to come up with a good solution for the problem. Um, and I feel lucky that we were able to sort of navigate that without getting anybody too upset. Um, so Although I am the one person who is coordinating the internships, I have a lot of support if I need it. Um, I feel very strongly that I could go to my college if, if something weren't going well. We also have an Office of Service Learning. So sometimes something needs to be paid for and they will, they have grants, which I have applied for and gotten for students to pay for things. So um, I think that we should all feel like we have these different resources at our universities, even if our job is to be the one setting up these service learning projects. There's a lot of support. Thank you so much. Um, Dr. Kruger, I think this one is, is geared more towards you, but um, we had um, a couple of questions about wondering how you assess and grade some of the activities that was discussed today but they specifically ask about the podcast. It's challenging to grade uh, such a creative project, uh, but like most assignments, I create a rubric uh, that's distributed to the students and I'm, I'm happy to share my rubric that I use for a podcast. Um, I actually modified it from a colleague's assignment. Um, and, and not only do they have to create the podcast with a group, um, so it's about four or five group members of their choice, but they also have to submit the script to me and the script has to show that they did the background research. So they're looking for peer reviewed sources and discussing this topic. And another key part of this assessment is a reflection. So I like them to talk about what was this process like for you? What was challenging? What was easy? And what would you do differently next time? Thank you. Um, and we only have a minute or two left, but if someone has a quick question they want to put in the Q&A, we'll try to get to that. 
Dr. Clendenin, um, someone is wanting you to say more about your smallpox simulation and maybe also how you assess that. Okay. Um, that's a great question. The smallpox simulation I'm using is one that Johns Hopkins University Center for Global Health Security put together called Atlantic Storm, and it's a web-based interactive. It's got handouts that you can download and print out. My groups are divided into the different countries, and as this, it's like a true tabletop exercise. They're presented with an initial scenario, and then as we progress through the simulation, the, the situation changes, and there's increased demands and questions that have to be answered. And the students have to talk as a country to decide how they're going to respond. And they keep getting fed information that changes. And like I said, it takes about three days. So at the end of the three days, they have what we call an after action review. And that's, that's kind of a, a term that's used in emergency management after a disaster's happened. All of the responding agencies do some sort of an after action review. They compile what worked, what didn't work, what needs to change, what needs to stay the same. And they compile it into a big document and then it's submitted to the, here in Texas to the county, which is then submitted to the state, which is then submitted to FEMA at the federal level. But I have my students do a modification of an after action review and I have three or four questions that specifically ask them about what happened in the simulation that they have to answer from the perspective of the country that they represented. One of the questions is um, everybody tends to turn to the World Health Organization to provide leadership in this particular scenario, but right now they do not have the capacity or the logistical capability to deliver the medical countermeasures that are needed for this particular scenario. So should they be given temporary global authority? And they have to answer that from the uh, perspective of the country that they're representing. And then the last two questions are about lessons learned. And that, those are more reflective and they ask them as a student or answer them as a student. So what is the big idea that you take away about public health and global health from this exercise? And what three lessons would you share with someone coming into this course? And so I limit it to five paper, five pages because I have a hundred students, but most of them are usually wanting more. They want more space to be able to answer those questions and that's seriously all they can talk about for the remainder of the semester is about that experience. Well, thank you so much. And I want to thank all of our speakers for sharing your expertise and all of your attention and thoughtful questions today. A recording of this webinar will be available shortly on ASPPH's website. Um, we encourage you, if you enjoyed today's session, uh, to disseminate the archive link to your peers or anyone who you think this might be helpful for. Um, and as you close out of the session today, please take two minutes to complete a brief survey to help improve future ASPPH events such as this. Zoom will direct you to the survey link in your internet browser upon exiting the webinar. Also, please note that the ASPPH virtual annual meeting runs through Friday, May 15th. ASPPH will not host webinars next Friday, April 10th, but webinars will resume on Friday, April 17th. We have three sessions coming up on April 17th, which are displayed here, and you can learn more about these and others on ASPPH's website. So this concludes today's webinar. Thank you all for joining.